Give Jesus a hand clap. Come on, clap your hands. Oh, you people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Praise His holy name. Jesus is Lord of Madeira and of California and of Missouri and of Wisconsin. Hallelujah. Praise God. Don't sit down yet. The Bible says when you stand praying, believe. So we're going to get you standing. Praise God. That is if you want to. I'm in such a good mood, I don't care if you stand or sit. Hallelujah. Just as long as you're praying. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Something is about to happen in this house. Amen. I feel the Holy Spirit. I sense that something is about to happen, something extraordinary. God has things planned for you. Let me ask you a question you can answer with a show of hands. How many of you are going through some sort of a realignment, a repositioning? You feel like you're at a crossroads. Isn't that amazing? Everyone I know in the body of Christ, it seems like, is being positioned for change, for something new. I mean, in my case, I'm going to Spain, praise God. I wish I'd made that announcement a long time ago. I'm getting invited out to eat and to preach, and everybody says, before you come to Spain, come see us. So I think I'll just milk this thing as long as I can. I'm getting a lot of free meals out of it. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see all you preachers here. I was envious. When I, of course, I know this meeting happens every year, and I, I've just uh, pined away and and uh, wanted to be a part of it and pouted a little, and here I am. Praise God. Pastor asked me if I wanted to come. Pastor Mike did, and I, I didn't even hesitate. I said yes. Before he could get the words out of his mouth, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. It was Pastor John's idea. All the good ideas come from Pastor John, and. And he's instructed by Sister Karen. Everybody give Sister Karen a hand clap. Praise God. The neck that turns the head. Amen. Praise God. I'm nice to her. She's the one who takes up offerings usually. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. This is my, uh, this is my prayer book. I'm putting people's names in here and taking you with me to Spain. You want to be in my prayer of agreement book, I'll leave this outside uh, with a pen and just write your name, give me your email so that I can contact you. And uh, I, I certainly encourage your prayers during this time of transition. Well, enough of that. Raise your hands. Let me bless you. Father, this is not just another gathering. This is a summit meeting. You have summoned us together. You've taken us apart into a high mountain to show us things that are happening beyond the horizon. That mount of revelation, that mount of transformation, transfiguration. We have not come into the mountain that shook and burned and had trumpets. That mountain filled with fire, but we've come to Mount Zion, the city of God and into the presence of innumerable angels dressed in festive array. The angel of the Lord surrounds us tonight. We are not alone. There are more with us than there are with them. In Jesus' name, thank you for the angels of God. Thank you for blessing everyone here. My prayer is that each person will receive what they need and be prepared for what is coming because something is coming something special is coming something extraordinary is coming we do not want to miss the day of our visitation we want to be ready for what you're about to do so prepare us tonight expand us tonight fill us tonight in Jesus name now I'm gonna ask you to pray for me that God would use me Stretch your hands and hearts out here. Father, I didn't call myself. You called me. I have not sent myself. You've sent me. I'm not here to declare me or my works. I'm here to declare you and your works. I can of myself do very little, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
I'll do my best to yield to you, to say what you want me to say, to do what you want me to do, so that you can do what you want to do here among your people on planet Earth in Jesus' name. And everybody said, can we give him one more hand clap? He's worthy. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. Come on and let's praise him. Before the rocks cry out, I'm going to praise him. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Praise God. Yeah, the enemy's running as if in terror. He's afraid. He should be afraid. Praise God. The army of the Lord is here. Praise God. You may be seated. I don't know how long you can stay seated, but you may be seated. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want you to uh, turn with me to St. John 1. Oh, hallelujah, I feel something amazing happening. Pastor John, I love you. I honor you. you. Your pastor, Pastor John, is more than a pastor. He is a prophet of God. He's one of God's seers who sees things and hears things and knows things. And every time Pastor John has shared something with me that God has shown him in the Spirit, I have received that as a special word from the Lord because he's very faithful about saying what God tells him to say. The Bible says that we should speak as the oracles of God. In other words, we should say what God says. Praise the Lord. Amen. There are a lot of self-styled prophets who have called themselves to be prophets or someone lied to them and told them they were a prophet. That's what Jesus warned about. He said in the last day there would be a lot of false prophets. So we need to take heed that not everyone who claims to be a prophet is a prophet. Praise the Lord. Spurious prophets. I'm not saying they're evil. I'm just saying they're, they're confused. There's one prophet from Australia said to me, he sent me an email. He said, the Lord has showed me that something is going to happen somewhere this year. Gave me cold chills. <laughs> How did he know that? <laughs> okay. Uh, in this first chapter, Philip has uh, has found Nathaniel and tells him about Jesus, and and Nathaniel kind of puts him down. Nathaniel is a cynic, and he asks, can any good thing come out of Madera, uh, Nazareth? <laughs> and uh, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him, verse 47, and he said of him, behold, indeed, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. In other words, a man who says what he means means what he says. Nathanael said unto him, Where do you know me from? Because obviously Jesus had hit the nail right on the head. When he said, Nathanael is a man without duplicity, without any guile, uh, that was absolutely true. And I'm sure that everyone who knew Nathanael knew that about him. He was one of those guys who would tell you, you know, you have spinach between your teeth, which you do right now. No, I'm just kidding you, Pastor Bob. Roy Hicks Jr. was up preaching, and he was kind of under the anointing. He was walking back and forth preaching. He walked past his wife. She said, psst. He ignored her because he was under the anointing. He walks over here and preaching. He walks back by her, and she says, psst, psst. He shakes his head. And he keeps walking. And every time he went by her, she went, psst, psst. And finally, he stopped. He said, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, my wife has something to say to me that is so important she is willing to interrupt my anointed sermon. He gave her the microphone and said, what do you have to say? Say it to everyone. She said, your zipper is unzipped. <laughs> Serves him right, doesn't it? See, you don't want to mess with people that have no guile. They, they, they don't know how to make things, you know, they don't use tact. Now, I'm from Texas. We, we're raised using tact. 
We're so tactful we can tell people to go to the blazes and they'll thank us for the advice. So I know about Nathaniels. They say what they mean and mean what they say and, and Jesus loves them if nobody else does. From whence knowest thou me? And Jesus said unto him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Now we don't stop there. The next thing that Jesus said is even more important than the first thing he said. Jesus answered and said unto him, Nathanael, because I said unto you that I saw you under the fig tree, I had this word of knowledge, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Everybody say greater. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That was a condition that Nathaniel met. He received the word of knowledge from Jesus. He believed the prophetic word that Jesus gave him. And Jesus said, because you did not reject the word that I gave you, now you're in position to see greater things than these. A lot of people want to see the greater things, but if you don't believe in the word of knowledge, if you don't believe in the word of wisdom, then how are you going to receive discerning into the realm of the Spirit? This thing of seeing angels is the gift of discerning, discerning of spirits. I'm a little leery of people, the only thing they discern are devils. You can't pick your nose without someone discerning a nose-picking devil. <laughs> to hear people talk, there's a devil behind everything. You know, when Flip Wilson blamed the devil for everything. The devil made me do it. A lot of people are like that. The de you know, I think the devil probably receives that as some sort of a perverted praise. Him getting blamed for stuff he didn't even do. There are more angels than there are devils. There are more with us than there are with them. The angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him and delivereth them. I believe in the ministry of angels. I know that there is a ministry of angels because I made it through my teenage years. <laughs> I know that there is a ministry of angels because you made it this far. They bear you up in their arms lest you crash your car against a stone. Well, that's an updated version of that. Every time I leave the house, I pray. The angel of the Lord goes before me and prospers me in my way. I don't leave the house without acknowledging angels. I believe in the ministry of angels. I believe that they excel in strength. I believe that they hearken and hasten to do the Word of God. Are they not all the ministers or the servants of us, the heirs of salvation? Hallelujah. Angels are at your beck and call. They are here to answer your prayers. God sends them to answer your prayers. They are messengers. They are soldiers. They are warriors. And they excel in strength. I believe in the ministry of angels. The Bible has more to say about angels than it does about devils. Billy Graham passed to heaven a few days ago. And of all the things he preached and, and taught, uh, there was such a blessing. His book on angels touched my heart. It is a classic, very simple book, but he went through and talked about the nine different class, classes of angels. Did you know that there are nine classes of angels? We know about cherubim and seraphim. Why is it that everybody has a picture of angels as being blonde-haired, blue-eyed women? You got any blonde-haired, blue-eyed angels in your house? Little statues of blonde-haired, blue-eyed angels. Pictures, Hallmark greeting cards with blonde-haired, blue-eyed angels. I can promise you that my Nubian princess wife does not have any blonde-haired, blue-eyed angels in our house. 
that went over the head of a lot of you. That's all right. You're not supposed to understand all of these things. <laughs> Did you know that not all the angels have wings? They look like men in really cool clothes, shiny garments. They look like men. It was Michael and Gabriel, not Michelle and Gabriella. The winged ones are kind of weird, you know? The seraphim with six wings? What's that, like a dragonfly or something? I don't think you'd want to see one of those with eyes all around their head and, you know, two wings to cover themselves and two wings to fly and what they do with the other two wings. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> There's something for every set of wings there, six wings. You just don't see that in children's coloring books. I think it's the archangels that probably look most like people as they blend in with people. They blended in when they went to Sodom and Gomorrah to rescue Lot. The Bible says some have entertained angels unaware as they blend in. Men in shining garments. The ministry of angels is from Genesis to Revelation. It's ubiquitous. The ministry of angels is throughout the scriptures. God made heaven and earth. He made the heavenly host before he made the earth. Lucifer was a cherubim, an anointed cherubim, till he sinned against God, rebelled against God, drew a third of God's angelic host into his rebellion. He must have been very persuasive. He was the sum total of beauty and wisdom. And because of the rebellion, there was a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels and cast the devil and his angels, guess where? Planet Earth. And they were already here when Adam was created. Devils were already here. That's why God created man and gave him dominion because he had to replenish and he had to restore, he had to bring order back. That was man's job, was to bring order, to have dominion. But through the fall, Lucifer set himself up to be the demigod of this world system. He's not my god, he ain't your god. But he is the demigod of the world system. Jesus' birth was announced by angels. You know, we need to revisit Christmas in the nativity. We got that thing all mixed up. We got wise men, angels, and cows all in the same thing there. <laughs> there were no wise men, no magi at the nativity in Bethlehem. There were shepherds. And they were out in the fields tending their sheep. And suddenly there appeared in the heavens an innumerable company of angels. And they said, peace on earth, goodwill unto men. And they announced the birth of Jesus, and they told the shepherds where Jesus was. Have you ever wondered why Joseph and Mary were in a sheep shed? Because Bethlehem is where the rabbinical shepherds raised the sheep that were used for sacrifice and the Passover lamb. And those weren't just ordinary shepherds. Those were shepherds who inventoried, took care of, and identified every lamb that was going to be used in sacrifice at the temple. They had pedigrees on those sheep. They watched those sheep. They guarded those sheep. And the best of the best was the Passover lamb. And guess what? Jesus, our Passover lamb, was born in a manger. And the first ones to come were the rabbinical shepherds. Isn't that amazing? God didn't do anything accidentally or randomly. Everything had a reason, even the birth of Jesus. Yeah, angels worship him. Jesus was, Jesus was led into the wilderness 
and tempted by the devil. You know about that. He was 40 days without food. He was hungry, he was weak, and he had suffered temptation. He had fought the battle of his life. And afterwards, the angels came and strengthened him. The angels ministered to Jesus and strengthened Jesus. How did they minister to Jesus? How did they strengthen Jesus? How did they steal him for the ordeals that were before him? It wasn't the last time they ministered to him when he was in the garden agonizing in prayer, sweating blood, crying out. My God, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering and bitterness, shame and pain pass from me. And then he crossed over to the point of obedience, and he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. He was at the end of his tether, and the angels came and ministered to him, strengthened him. What happened next? His suffering, the beatings, the crucifixion, death, torment, substitutionary sacrifice. But oh, three days later, there are angels in an empty tomb. And they said, why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. He's in Jerusalem. You cannot separate the ministry of Jesus from the ministry of angels. Angels are part and parcel to the Bible. Now, we are told by Paul that we don't, we don't worship angels. They are the servants to the heirs of salvation. We don't worship angels. We command them. We expect them to do their job. We allow them to do their job. I, for one, believe in the ministry of angels. Hereafter, you shall see the heavens open and the angels of God. Hereafter, the Holy Spirit will open your eyes to the realm of God. Hereafter, you will see beyond your natural seeing into the land of no horizons. You will see the comings and goings and commerce of angels. There are things that happen in this life that can only be explained by angels. There are things that have happened to you and to your life that make you scratch your head. How did I get through that? How did I survive? How did I make it? I've got the answer. Angels. Hallelujah. They've, they've intervened in our lives so many times. When we get to heaven and God reveals all secrets, we will be amazed at how often the angels of God delivered us. The devil is walking around, is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Thank God that when we're napping, the angels ain't napping. <laughs> and when we aren't paying attention, they're paying attention. And when we've got our guard down, they're guarding us. Praise the Lord. His angel doth always look. Speaking of children, their angel doth always look uh, upon the Father. Yeah, I believe in guardian angels. Some years ago, probably something like 1983, I came out to California to preach for Pastor Dick Brunell. We're holding a conference somewhere, and I said, hey, Pastor Dick, let's go abalone diving. He said, what's abalone? I said, you know, the shellfish that are in the rocks on the Pacific. Let's go abalone diving, harvest our own abalone. He said, I wouldn't have a clue how to do that. Never been. I said, well, give me a minute. I've got an amazing gift. I looked around this room, and I saw a tall, skinny guy, young guy with a suntan. I went up to him. I said, are you an abalone diver? He said, oh, man, yes, I am. Why? Do you want to go? I said, me and Pastor Dick want to go. He said, you come to the right person. I've got all the gear. He said, you don't need anything. 
So the next day we're in Half Moon Bay in a motor home. We pick this guy up. He's got wetsuits. He's got weights. He's got rafts. He's got anchors. He's got abalone knives. He's got it all. We drive up US-1. We're going out there past Sausalito, past Mount Tam, you know, past Stinson Beach. We're headed up there past Gurneyville. We're headed towards Fort Ross and the Russian River. And it's beautiful. Have you ever been down US-1? I mean, there are cliffs 200 and 300 foot tall, and you look down at the breakers and the mighty Pacific Ocean crashing over rocks. Oh, it's exciting. We're driving along there. And we pulled over on this cliff, and I thought, of course, we're just going to do some sightseeing and take some pictures. No, this kid starts getting out the wetsuits and the anchors and the rafts. We're, we're, we're not on the beach. We're up on a mountain. And he throws me a wetsuit that is, well, I'm a 46 XL. And it was like a 42 regular. <laughs> a wetsuit is just a, a man girdle is all it is. I'm, I can't get my feet through this thing. I can't get my calves through this thing. I am pulling and stretching and sucking and pulling, and I'm out of breath. I get in the thing, and it's just crunching me like this. I, I feel like I'm in, a, in, in one of those pressure suits that aviators use when they're going into the stratosphere. And now I have to zip it up. I got to push parts of me out of the way and suck and pull and pull. <sighs> and I've got this thing zipped up and I cannot breathe. I'm breathing like this. <laughs> and then this kid looks at me and he said, well, you're kind of fat. You're going to be buoyant. You need about 50 pounds of weight to sink you. And he throws me a weight belt with 50 pounds of lead. Smart Alec. And then he gives me an abalone knife. It's made out of the shackle of a car. You know, leaf spring. It's one of the leaves. It's got a bicycle handle on one end, kind of a chisel point on the other. That's what you use to pry the abalone off the rock. The abalone are in the roughest places, in the cold water, sucked up against rocks, and they don't want to be harvested. So they go to the most dangerous spot that they can go. Then this kid gives us a window sash weight for an anchor, about five pounds of cast iron that's uh, tied with about 100 foot of nylon rope. You get a picture of this? My, my, my mask is too small. I was like, Everything up, you know. <laughs> Little mask, about that big. I can't even close my mouth. And a snorkel. And a raft. It is a rubberized cloth raft, industrial. Not one of these things that you kids play in. This is a serious inflatable raft. It had a valve stem like you would use on a truck tire. You know what valves be, stems mean? It means that you should have a tire pump. No. This kid is expecting me to blow it up. I can't blow it up. I can't breathe. The wind is blowing like it always does out there at a gale. We're looking down at rocks the size of houses, and waves are going over the top of the rocks. <laughs> this is my idea. I think the kid is going to huddle and he's going to teach us, talk to us about abalone diving and what we have to do. No. He just goes to this barbed wire fence, goes over it, and starts traversing this mountain. His, his raft's already blown up, everything. I'm still blowing mine up. <laughs> Dick Brunel looks at me and he takes off to the, out after the kid. His raft is blown up. I'm still over there going... <laughs> This raft is on the end of a rope, and it is like, it's like trying to carry a dirigible. Is that a real word? 
it's blowing around in the wind like this, this and it's and it's just pulling me all over the place. I can't even hardly make it over the barbed wire fence because this raft is trying to pull me off the mountain, and I'm going down the mountain, and it's steep with this raft going like this. And I'm thinking, whose dumb idea was this to go abalone diving? I'm up on the side of the cliff about halfway down, and I watch the kid. He grabs his raft. He runs towards the surf. He dives through these big breakers, pops up on the other side, and he's dog paddling out through fields of kelp. I can see the kelp from up there. I hate it. It's slimy. I don't like it touching me. I, my imagination, I, I think of all sorts of things when kelp is touching me. I grew up swimming in creeks and, and lakes in Texas. We didn't have kelp. We didn't have great white sharks either. This kid is way out there. I mean, he's 100, years off, 100 yards offshore. And Dick looks at me, and he jumps in the water and paddles out there going over waves. And I jump in the water, and my raft folds up. I don't have enough air in it. My buddies are way out there, and I'm by myself on the beach, and I don't want to be left out here by myself. After all, this is my idea. And so I, I blow and blow and blow. I put my flippers on, and they are like a size 10. I wear a size 13. My toes are like this. <laughs> Mask is like this. I can't breathe. I'm all zipped. <laughs> Got this kind of rough like <laughs> Five, 50 pounds of weight, five pound window, window sash weight here, all this rope and everything. And I jump into the water again, and instantly I have cramps in both legs. <laughs> but I'm determined to get out here. And I'm swimming, and salt water, the wind is knocking the top of these waves off. It's blowing right at me at a gale force, and I am swallowing salt water. I've got water inside of my mask. It's up to here. My eyes are burning with salt water. I am throwing up. You know what happens when you drink a lot of salt water? I am, I am sorry, I am puking salt water. I'm trying to tell you how bad it is, but it's a lot worse than I'm actually saying. I feared for my life. I'm swimming out there, my, le my legs are cramped, and, and, and I'm hearing music from Jaws. <laughs> you didn't know this was going to be so much fun tonight, did you? If you hear the sound track from Jaws, don't go in the water. That's a sign. And I'm watching this kid. He's going down, get, doing something under the water with the kelp, coming back up, putting, putting an abalone in a basket. Oh, we had baskets too. <laughs> Pastor Dick is just holding on to his raft. He's not doing anything. He's just bopping up and down, up and down. My beloved brother in Christ, my buddy, my friend. I swam over to him. I'm kind of wild-eyed. Snot's coming out of my nose. <laughs> Tears are in my eyes. And I said, Dick, 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 I'm in trouble, man. I'm in trouble. I, I can't handle this. It's over my head. He said, get away from me. <laughs> my buddy says, do not come near me. He's, he's imagining that I'm going to drown and take him down with me, you know. Try to, try to stand on his shoulders in a hundred foot of water. And he said, he said, go away, go away. He said, the wind is blowing toward the shore. He said, the wind will blow you back. You don't have to do anything. The wind will blow you back. And I said, yeah, 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 the wind, the wind. And, and I said, I, I got to go. I'm in trouble. I'm over my head. Uh, 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 uh. And I start towards the shore, but I'm, I'm really, really struggling. And there is a house, this, uh, a rock the size of a house, a snow-capped rock. <laughs> Covered with birds, <laughs> seagulls, pelicans. And every time a wave hits it, it goes kapoosh. 
and this water goes up in the air over the rock, and the birds go, wah, 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 and they fly around a little bit, and then they come back down on the rock, and a couple of moments later, another big breaker comes in, and I'm headed towards the rock, snow cap, birds, everything. I don't care. I am dying here. I'm drowning. <laughs> and I'm on the windward side, and the waves are just slamming me into the rock, and I'm slamming me into the rock. And finally, I'm fighting for my life. I'm getting, I've got all this stuff on me. I've got toe holes and fingernail holes, and I'm climbing up this rock, and the, the waves are hitting me, trying to pull me under, but I'm fighting, and <laughs> I get praying, oh, God, oh, get, up there, get on top of it. And finally, I'm on top of it, and I just lay down and slide on about two inches of guano. It wasn't snow. You don't know what guano is? Anybody here don't know what guano is? It's bird crap. Can you say that in church? Too late. I don't care if it is guano. I've got it on my face. I've got it on my body. I'm, I'm, water's coming out of my mouth. I'm crying. I'm, <laughs> I'm as if this thing, let it all hang out. <laughs> the seagulls are just hovering, squawking. <laughs> They can't land because there is a whale, a killer whale, <laughs> beached on top of the rock. <sighs> I hear someone, I hear a little voice calling to me, help, help. I look down, it's my friend Dick. <laughs> he's swimming for the rock for all he's got, man. And he says, I, I can't make it. I can't get clo any closer. From where I am, I can see what's happening. His window sash weight has 50 foot of rope, and he's dragging it through the kelp forest. And I can see all this kelp just, you know, behind him. He's pulling all this kelp, and he's paddling, paddling. Well, he can't go any farther because he's got this anchor that's in the kelp. And I said, your anchor, your anchor. He went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, and he, rolls it in, and he comes swimming at the rock, and he crashes and goes down and crashes and goes down. I'm just watching. I'm in no help to her. I'm in no, no shape to help anybody. Besides that, he wouldn't help me when I was in trouble. Forget him. Say, how's this changing my life? Well, it changed my life, and I'm hoping that you'll learn something. At least learn, don't go abalone fishing. <laughs> Finally, he claws his way up to the top, and he slides in on the guano, and both of God's men of faith and power are lying there, panting, crying, puking, covered in guano. <laughs> Meanwhile, our friend is going down, and he's catching Dick's abalone. He's catching my abalone. He's limited out this day. Dick and I get where we're strong enough to sit up, talk a little bit. And I said, man, this is a young man's sport. I'm like 42. <laughs> this kid's like 22. Dick said, yeah, it's a young man's sport. I said, I, I don't have any business out here. I said, it's out of my element, man. It's, uh, wind's too strong. Water's too cold. Waves are too big. And I said, I I'm sorry, Dick. I got you into this. This was my idea. I said, but I really, really wanted, to, wanted an abalone. I wanted to be able to, to get my own abalone and cook my abalone, be the mighty hunter. And I said, I bought, a, I bought an out-of-state fishing license and everything, and I'd be happy if I had one abalone. And he said, well, why do we have to go out in the rough water? He said, don't you think there's abalone on this rock? He said, on the leeward side of the rock, uh, that's nautical language, windward, leeward. You impressed? <laughs> it's kind of calm because this big rock the size of the house is blocking the wind. So I get over to the edge, and I look down, and I see the swells come up, 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 up. And then I see the swells go down, 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 down. 
up, 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 close to me. Down, 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 down. I worked my way down the rock where I'm right there. I put on my flippers, toes are crunched. Put on my mask, right here. Zip this thing up. I said to Dick, I'm going to go in there and get an abalone, and I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> I put my leg down in the water, and I hear a voice, an audible voice. Audible. It said, if you insist on doing this, there is nothing I can do to save you. I said, hey, I don't insist. <laughs> I quit. Pastor Dick said, who are you talking to? I said, I don't know, but I'm not talking to you. <laughs> that was the scariest voice I'd ever heard in my life. You know, dear God. I said, just get me off the rock. I will never go abalone diving again. I swear to God, I will never. I made a promise to God right there, and I have kept it. I don't even eat abalone anymore. <laughs> Do you know where the breeding ground for the great white sharks is? It's between the Farallon Islands, Half Moon Bay, and the Russian River, Fort Ross. We are right in the middle of the abalone breeding grounds. Do you know what they feast upon? Seals. Big, blubberous, black seals. They prefer the wounded seals that make funny noises and thrash around in the water. And I don't think a fat preacher in a wetsuit with cramps in his legs looks any different to a great white shark than a seal. You want to go shark fishing? Use a preacher for bait. It's kind of funny, but that day, a surfer was attacked in Half Moon Bay. That day, we're out here playing the fool. I apologize for that story. I mean, it has so little redeemable quality. I'm, I'm going to have to work real hard to make it fit into my sermon here. But sometimes when you have a good sermon, it's worth using whether it makes any sense or not. But I, I do know this, you don't tempt the Lord thy God. And there are certain things that, that we're, we're tasking and testing our angels. And they're, they're not like people. They don't have a sense of humor like people. Angels kill anybody God tells them to kill. Kill a Christian just as quick as he kills a heathen. Never even raises a heartbeat. No compassion. They do exactly what they're told to do like a robot. If, 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 if David hadn't repented, the angel of, of God would have destroyed Jerusalem. Don't mess around with your angels. And when you make a vow, don't defer to keep your vow. And don't say before the angels, well, it was a mistake, lest they grow angry with you and destroy the works of your hands. Don't fool around with your angels. They mean business. They are serious about God's work. They are serious about the battles we're in. They're serious about doing the will of God. And we need to get serious too. I honestly believed I had a conversation with an angel that day. I honestly be believed that if I, had, if I had gone against that, I wouldn't be here today. I believe that. And when we get to heaven, you'll find out I was right. If you ever have this, this feeling you shouldn't leave the house? you Have ever had this feeling you shouldn't get on the airplane? you ever had this feeling that you shouldn't do something stupid you're about to do? Could be your angels trying to talk to you. I've seen uh, my angels more than once. And other people have seen them. I've had people all down through the years uh, tell me about the angels they see with me. It's always the same story which is interesting because one, one experience by one person is, is kind of backed up by the experience of another person. 
Uh, for example, I was in Chicago one day holding some meetings, uh, great meetings, and uh, this Greek woman brought her 13-year-old son up to me. She said, Aristotle, tell Brother Huggins what you saw. And he said, no, Mama. I said, go ahead, Aristotle, tell me what you saw. And he said, well, I don't want you to think that I'm weird. And I'm not given to seeing things, but I saw two angels with you. They were on the platform. They were behind you on either side, and, and they were big. They said they were so big they made you look small. And he said they were watching everything you did and listening to everything you said. I said, Aristotle, I believe you really did see something because five minutes ago a man came up to me and told me exactly the same thing in almost the same words. He said, Brother Larry, I'm not given to seeing things, but I saw two angels on the platform with you standing against the wall on either side behind you watching and listening to everything you said and did. Ed Dufresne saw my angels over here in Fresno a few years ago. Some of you may have been there. Scared the hell out of me. <laughs> and you don't want to mess with angels. They're, they're scary. Pastor Ed Dufresne's up on the platform preaching, and, and you know about that, that building, that big circus tent-looking place. And uh, Pastor Tom and I are over here, and Ed Dufresne's lost in the spirit, staggering around like a drunk man, and he stops and he looks up and he says, Oh, my God. There's an angel, and he's so big, why his head almost goes up to the top of the ceiling. And he looks over here, he said, my God, he said, there's another angel. Wow, he's as big as this angel. And he said, and they're both looking at Brother Larry Huggins. They're both looking at you, Brother Huggins. The angels are looking at you. And he said, this one's got a scroll, and he's unfurling his scroll, and it says, Power. He looks over here, and he said, uh, this one's got a scroll, and he's unrolling it, and it says, no, this one says money. He said, money, money. He said, this one says power, pointed to his left. Now, I'm not going to tell this story, but I did get struck by lightning once in the natural, electrifying. And I know what it feels like in the seconds before you get struck. The air gets still, your body becomes either negatively or positively charged, and your hair stands up right before the lightning strikes. It gets warm, still, and your body gets charged. And I'm up there on the platform, and all of a sudden it got warm and still, and my hair raised up, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get struck. And I took off running as fast as I could to try to leave the platform, big platform. I'm, it's kind of like I'm running in slow motion. And I look back over my shoulder, and Ed Dufresne ducks and makes some sort of noise like, <laughs> and the lightnings of God came out of that scroll, hit between me and Tom Timmons. It launched him backwards, heels overhead, and it launched me forward like an explosion. And I rolled down all the steps, and I ended up in the floor. <laughs> Lightning bolt from heaven. The Bible says, who maketh his, his ministers, his angel spirits, and his ministers flames of fire. That word there is lightning bolts. I got struck by the lightning of God. It made me mad. I got struck by the power angel. I wanted to get struck by the money angel. Come on. <laughs> but no, I get struck by the power angel. <laughs> you ever have things happen to you you can't explain? I got trapped in an elevator in Mexico, uh, in uh, Kansas City. Uh, a big freight elevator with the crazy guys bigger than I am. And, and this was a big freight elevator. It's as big as this platform almost, uh, you know, 12 by 24. And, uh, and he goes nuts, and he parks the elevator between the fifth and sixth floors where nobody can get in or out. And he said, I'm going to put you in the hospital for six weeks. And he runs at me with his fist doubled up. And I pointed my finger at him and said, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. He went across the elevator about 12 feet, slammed up against the wall, pinned there on his tiptoes. Couldn't move. Don't mess with me. I got powerful friends in high places. Hallelujah. (laughs) 
Everybody's talking about gun control and self-defense and everything. All I need is this finger right here. All I need is this finger right here. Praise God. I'm in Jackson Penitentiary uh, preaching. They say there are more guns and knives in Jackson Penitentiary than there are in Detroit. And my meeting was invaded by a Satanist, martial art, evil, sodomizing murderer. When he walked in the room, I'm telling you what, everybody got on edge. They knew him. He had a black cell with pentagrams and Satanist Bible, and he was evil, evil. Everybody, everybody changed their posture when he walked in. He walked over there towards me. He sits down close, stares at me. I just kept writing on the blackboard. He walks over to my table and he picks up three sharp pencils. Don't take sharp pencils into the prison with you. You don't learn these things in Bible school. <laughs> and he arranges them in some sort of weird hex. I ignored him. I kept writing. He gets up and he rearranges them. Devils are crazy. I ignored him. I kept writing. After the service, four or five inmates kind of herded this crazy guy towards me. They didn't touch him, but they're standing around him, and they kind of walk him towards me, and they said, this fellow needs deliverance. And I said, you know who I am, you devil. And he jumped down into a crouch that looked like something Bruce Lee would do and started his karate move, and he, he came at me with a fury. These inmates jumped on him, tried to hold him back. He threw them across the room, and he came towards me. To me, it was like he was moving in slow motion. I went into the matrix. <laughs> Seemingly. And I know he's moving fast, but I reached out and took him by the wrist. It was the easiest thing in the world. And he, and he went. He just looked at me. Couldn't move. I let go of him, and he stepped back and shook himself. And he went through the thing again. He dropped down into this karate stance. He charges me. Big guys jump on him. He slings him across the room, and he's trying to hurt me. And the same thing happened. I grabbed him by the wrist. And he went. I let go of him. He was still like that. I told these Christian inmates there, I said, take him to the back of the room and cast the devil out of him. He went, yeah, sure, right. How do you explain things like that? I was in Lemon, Costa Rica, and Pastor Jim Zirkel asked me to uh, escort a couple of the teenage girls out, out on a soul-winning thing, passing out tracks, so I took them. This crazy guy came up to us. He's demonized. He's saying some nasty things about the girls. They don't know what he's saying. But I grew up on the Mexican border. I knew exactly what he was saying. I said, hey, you devil, shut your mouth. I said, we're here to get people saved. Do you want to get saved? He's cussing. I said, you got a choice here. You can either give your heart to Jesus, and I'll cast the devil out of you, or you can get the hell out of here. That's why I'm the missionary, and you're not. I hope that's a train out there. Thank God. I didn't know what was happening for a moment. Maybe I stepped over the line a little bit too much. <laughs> About to see me cry like a girl, you know. Ah, I didn't mean it. And, uh, and I, I, I told the guy, I said, get the hell out of here. And he walks off. He staggers down the road. And it's just like a devil jumped over him and jumped into the driver of a dump truck full of rocks. And the driver of the dump truck... I saw him when it came on him. A murderous rage came on that guy for no reason. And he, he was wild-eyed, and he accelerated, and he's running right towards me and the two girls. And there's no room for him to stop. He is going to run over us. 
And I raised my finger. You forgot about that, didn't you? So I rebuke you in Jesus' name. It was like he had invisible, hit an invisible brick wall and did a face plant in the, in the window there. I led the girls back to our little headquarters room, and I kind of didn't mean to be eavesdropping, but they were talking to Pastor Zirkel. They said, have you ever been witnessing with Brother Larry? <laughs> They said, it's real different. (laughs) Listen, listen. When you know that you have the army of the Lord backing you up, you get really bold. When you know that the angels of God surround you, you get really brave. When you know that they're to watch your backside and to guard you, yeah, yeah, you can be pretty mouthy. You You can brag a little bit. Because i got powerful friends in high places. Hallelujah. Don't mess with me. I'll introduce you to those two big angels up there. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. I wouldn't want to go the places I go without angels. I wouldn't want to do what I do without angels. But I tell you, the truth is just as dangerous living in the United States of America. You can't even go to school without wondering what might be there. If ever we needed the ministry of angels, it's today. If ever we needed to teach our kids about angels, it's today. If ever we were sure that we're surrounded by the angel of the Lord, it it needs to be now, today. Praise God for the ministry of angels. Jesus was ministered to by the angels, and I believe the angels want to minister to you. Praise God. Hallelujah. The prophet ate angel food and it kept him going for 40 days. Hallelujah. Let's stand on our feet. I want our pretty pianist to come back up here. Is she still here? She's in the bathroom? You'll do. You're not as pretty, but you'll do. Angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord surrounds you and protects you. The angel of the Lord watch over you. The angel of the Lord guards you, keeps you safe. The angel of the Lord fights your battles. The angels of the Lord bring messages from the throne of heaven. The angel of the Lord goes before you and prospers you in your journey. The angel of the Lord surrounds you and bear you up in, your, in their arms lest you dash your foot against a stone. The angel of the Lord is here tonight. The angels of God, the ministers of light, They excel in power, they excel in might, and they are here to fight the good fight. Yeah, they whipped the devil and cast him out of heaven long ago, and they're going to cast him out of your life. They're going to cast him out of your house. They're going to cast him out of your school. They're going to cast him out of your church, the angel of the Lord. I believe they're surrounding this building right now. Hallelujah. And they're not little blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white women. They excel in strength. They're mighty. They're powerful. Praise God. They are here at the beck and call of God Himself. One of the most amazing angelic experiences I ever had was right up here in Loomis, California. Two angels came to me. I was lost in the spirit for three and a half hours. No one left the church for three and a half hours. Nobody moved, nobody talked, no babies cried. For three and a half hours, I was prostrate on the floor. The clouds of glory enveloped me, and two angels talked to me. And they said, we've come from the presence of God to bring you a message, that God is releasing a message of biblical economics into your life. And you know what happened after that angelic visitation? Over a dozen people in that assembly became millionaires within a year. It's true. Actually, much more than that. But I'm just talking about the people there. There were about 30 of us there that night. And over half of them became millionaires before the year was over with. They're still millionaires. My angel shall go before thee and prosper thee in thy journey. Hallelujah. Praise God. Lift your hands. Worship God. The angels worship Him. The angels say, holy, holy, holy. They cry out to God. 
Praise the Lord. The angels rejoice when someone is saved. The angels rejoice when we have a victory here on earth. The angels rejoice. Those kids in Pakistan have angels. If they didn't, they would have already been destroyed. They got secret police who look for these pastors and teachers and they take them out. You preach the gospel in Pakistan, you can be martyred. The angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is standing beside you. The angel of the Lord is strengthening you. The angel of the Lord is stealing you for the journey ahead. The angel of the Lord is making you strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Heaven is touching you, making you strong. It doesn't make any difference what might go wrong. The angels are going to help you turn it around and make it right. The angel of the Lord is standing before you, ministering to you this very night. The angel of the Lord does not leave you. The angel of the Lord does not forsake. The angel of the Lord is here at the beck and call of God, and their will is to obey. The angel of the Lord hovers over you. This is true. The angel of the Lord protects you. The angel of the Lord fights your battles. The angel of the Lord protects your people and protects your church. And to the angel of the church at Oakhurst, signs and wonders, visible Shekinah, heavenly light, angels are going to be seen by many people's eyes. The heaven will be open and they'll see the angel of the Lord ascending and descending upon you even in Oakhurst. Pastor Bob, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, you're not alone when you come and where you go. You're not alone when you preach God's Word. You're not by yourself. The angel is working with you. The angel is working in Panama. The angel is working in Wisconsin. The angel of the Lord is working with you. The angel of the Lord keeping you strong, keeping you from harm, no matter what might seem to go wrong. Can the enemy defeat God's army? No, no, no. It is true. God's army is greater. The greater one is with you. Those who excel in power and might they're with you to help you fight the fight. The battle is with you. The battle is with the Lord. You're secure in His arms. It doesn't make any difference of the size of a person or whether they might be threatening or mean. That means nothing to the angel of the Lord. They're mighty in God. They excel in strength. And to the angel of the church at Madeira say it's time for signs and wonders to be released. It's time for those visible portents of heaven, smoke and fire and thunder and lightning. It's time for a new Pentecost. The angel of the Lord is with you, protecting you, keeping you, going with you, helping you to do what God has sent you to do. Sister Karen, the angel of the Lord, strengthened Jesus. Not once, but twice. Theologically, think about that. Here is the Son of God, Jesus, Messiah, Savior, Healer, Deliverer, and yet He needed the ministry of angels. And on two occasions, they ministered to Him and strengthened Him. You're going to outrun the chariots. <laughs> You're going to run and not grow weary. You're going to walk and not faint. You're going to rise up on wings as eagles. The angels are bearing you up above the fray. The angels are going to take you all the way. Great things are going to happen that only angels can explain. Things that happen that cause, causes things to be rearranged. Everybody lift your hands and worship God. The angels of heaven are here. The angels say, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. The angels are strengthening you. The angels are making you strong. The angels are righting what's wrong. 
the angels of God, they're at your beck and call. The angels of God will keep you and you shall not fall. The angel of the Lord, big and strong and tall, is with you one and all. The angel of the Lord equalizes everyone. <laughs> it makes no difference if you're short or tall or young or old. The angels of the Lord are going to make you as victorious as anyone. As anyone. We don't trust in chariots. We don't trust in horses. We trust in God. We trust in the Lord. Everybody begin worshiping God. There are angels in the room. Coming and going. Going and coming. Coming from heaven above. The traffic of angels. Jacob saw a ladder that went from earth to heaven and the angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. He said, this is Bethel. This is the house of God. He built an altar. In the Hebrew language, that word ladder literally means highway. He saw a highway. He saw a passageway. He saw a doorway in heaven and he saw a highway with angelic intercourse coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. They're coming and going to your house. They're coming and going to you. You shall see the heavens open and the angels coming and going. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You'll see the angels coming and going. You'll see the results of angels. You'll witness the results of angels. You'll know you've been in the presence of angels. Whether you see them with your natural eye or not, you'll see them with the eye of faith in the realm of the Spirit. Know this for a fact. The angels are with you every night and every day. They watch over you. Lift your hands and wave them around. We're in the presence of angels. We're in the presence of God. We're in the presence of the spirits of just men made perfect and an innumerable company of angels. Innumerable angels. Innumerable angels. Angels without number. There are more with you than there are with them. Angels without number. You cannot count them. Infinite host of heavenly angels more than enough more than enough more than enough you don't have one or two or just a few you've got a host you've got an army that surrounds you when you leave the house they go with you when you go to work they go with you when you're driving down the highway they go with you when you're at the store they go with you when you're at school, they go with you. When you're in church, they go with you. They're assigned to you. They're sent to guard you. They're sent to open up the way for you. They're sent to communicate with you. I believe in angels. We don't worship angels. We worship God. Jesus is the King of the host. He is the Lord of hosts. Open up ye gates, open you everlasting doors, and the Lord of King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. Mighty in battle. Ha <laughs> ha. The King of angels. Open wide ye gates, open you everlasting doors. In other words, open your heart, open your life, open your mind, and the King of glory, the Lord of hosts, will come in with his host. You see, Pastor Tom. I said there's always two angels, but they're the head of a host. I got two armies. Two armies. Two armies. Two armies. I saw the army one day, and it went as far as I could see. Wow, hallelujah. Yeah. Ah, yes, I shall go in Jesus' name, and I'll have angels working with me in Spain. <laughs> I'll go with angels across the sea, and they'll go before and prosper me. You've got a host. You've got a host. You've got an army that's with you. And though the enemy would like to destroy you, he's gone as far as he can go, 
and he's done as much as he can do, and you're still here, and the army of the Lord is with you. <laughs> Nothing to fear. No reason to dread. It's all going to work out good, just like he said. I want you to take your seats for a moment. Keep praising God. I believe that what happens in the last moments of a meeting are very significant. And I believe what happens here in the last minutes of this meeting are significant. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about it tonight. I want you to think about the army of God surrounding you. I want you to have a vision of that. I want you to visualize it. It's true. We know it because the Bible says it's so. And as I said, whether you see them with your natural eye or not, you will discern them. And you will see and experience things that can only be explained by the intervention of angels. I don't think you, you would have made it this far without angels. They've snatched you out of danger many times. They've blocked and stopped the enemy many times. They've thrown up a barrier around you many times. I read the Bible, you know, that's a good thing to do. In the last day, harvesting angels go out and bring in souls. In the last days, the angels go to the four corners of the heavens and bring the saints back. You see the ministry of angels increasing as we go further into the end times. I'm expecting not fewer incidences of angelic intervention. I'm expecting more frequent, more often. And someone will be telling you about a great thing that God did or some great sign or great, some great wonder, and your mind will say, had to be angels. Had to be angels. Had to be angels. How do you explain some things? Had to be angels. Had to be angels. While you're sleeping, they're watching over you. They're there to protect and watch over you. They're there to guard, to get you safely through. While you're sleeping at night, the angels watch over you. <laughs> the angels watch over you. They watch over your children and your family. They keep you safe in victory. Yes, the angels are watching over thee watching over thee. Right now I'm visualizing, I believe I'm seeing in the spirit, angels in rank and file, shoulder to shoulder, surrounding Believer's Church here in Madeira. And this will blow your mind, but don't think horizontally. Think angels above you. Think angels below you. They're in the realm of the spirit. They can go through a mountain. They can go through solid rock. They can go to the center of the earth. They uphold you. They're not just above your head. They're under your feet. They're not just on the horizontal plane. They're in an orb, a locust of protection. Over, above, under, and through. So the enemy can't get to you. He can't tunnel under and sneak up some other way because the angels got you covered. <laughs> yeah. Angels. Angels. We're going to sit here in the presence of God for a moment thinking about angels. They are the ministers to the heirs of salvation. That's you. Servants. They're here to serve you. I think just about any time there's a sign or a wonder, there's probably an angel behind it.
there's going to be ministry in this, these meetings probably every service. We have very able and capable ministers here. And before this weekend is over, you would have been anointed more than once and prayed for more than once and have hands laid on you more than once. My, my, my assignment here tonight is just to help you open your eyes to the angelic. To have eyes that see hereafter you shall see greater things than these. You shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending. You're about ready to step into some deeper water here, my sister. You're about ready to step into some deeper ministry. You're about ready to be thrust into the midst of the battle. But it's a good thing, not a bad thing. It's nothing to fear because the angels of the Lord are here. Yeah, you're going to rise up on eagle's wings and you're going to experience some of the deeper things it's changing it's changing it's changing for you but don't you worry the Lord is getting you through yeah praise God hallelujah you're gonna make it everybody lift your hands to God to the Lord of hosts mighty in battle yeah Do not be afraid of the things you see coming upon the earth. Do not be afraid of the things you hear. Do not be moved by worry, dread, or fear. Do not be afraid of nuclear war, pestilence, or disease. Do not be afraid of the enemy. Do not be afraid of tomorrow or what tomorrow may bring. You're protected by the same army that protects the king. Do not be afraid to go to school. Do not be afraid of people who rage on the roads. Do not be afraid of people who sow confusion wherever they go. Do not be afraid of the threats of your enemy and your family. Do not be afraid of the ex who's threatened you. Because the angel will knock him down. Paralyze him. And he will know that you don't touch God's anointed. Yeah, it's so. No fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, no more. No fear, no fear, no fear. You're protected by the army of the Lord. No fear, no fear, no fear. Of jackboot vigilantes. No fear of terrorists. And they're antics no fear of the arrow that flies by day or the plague only with your eyes will you see the destruction of the enemy but it's not going to come to your house yeah don't be afraid of fire earthquake or wind don't be afraid of the winds and the tumultuous sea the Lord is protecting thee. Here's my last prayer for you tonight. I command the spirit of fear to leave God's people. That every person here, man, woman, boy, and girl, is instantly delivered from fear and timidity. God has not given us the spirit of timidity again to fear, but power and love and a sound mind. Live fear-free. Live in faith. Live in confidence. Live in grace. Live in the knowledge of the Word that is true. And live in the promise that God is able to keep you. He will keep you. He does keep you. And He shall keep you in the years ahead.
Now, here's the way I see things. This is just me. I was holding a crusade in India. I've held, I've held 15 uh, major miracle crusades in India. And uh, the police contacted uh, my team and me, and they said, we've gotten written death threats that, from the RSS. Now, the RSS is a militant terrorist group in India who uh, claimed responsibility for the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. And since then, they've been in a lot of, involved in a lot of uh, nefarious things. And the police took it very seriously. They said, we fear for your life. They say, if you preach tonight, they're going to kill you. They're going to assassinate you. <laughs> and I said, shut down the meeting? No way, not on your life. Miracles are getting ready to happen here. If the devil is that stirred up, if the devil is that afraid of me, there's no way I'm going to back down. God's getting ready to do something. Hallelujah. And, and, and it's amazing how brave and how bold you'll get when you know that there are people out there that hate you, and maybe there's a gun trained on me, maybe somebody's got their finger on a trigger, and the way I see it, if this is my last message, I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach my best. I'm going to give it my best. I'm not going to go out whimpering and crying. I'm going to go out preaching the gospel and shouting in Jesus' name. Praise God. So that may be just me. But when the enemy starts stirring things up, I get excited because I, I, I believe that God's getting ready to do something a lot bigger and a lot better. Hallelujah. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Are you going through a test right now? God's getting ready to do something bigger and better. Is the devil bugging you? God's getting ready to do something bigger and better. Have you been going through hell? Heaven is about ready to explode into your life. God's going to do something bigger and better. If you believe that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Glory to God. Just worship the Lord. Thank Him for the angels. Thank Him for the angels in your life. Thank Him for the angels. Hallelujah. Back in 2010, the Lord spoke to me one day, and he said, you know me very well as your Savior, your healer, your Father. He said, but you don't know me very well as King. And uh, he just talked to me about that. He said, uh, he began to show me Lord Saboath, the Lord of armies, angel army, armies primarily. He began to teach me and and. For several months, he taught me things that I, I didn't understand. And when Karen and I went, we, every fall, we go to Branson, Missouri, to Billy Brim's prayer gathering. We went that fall, and before the meeting even started, we had a prayer meeting for the prayer meeting. And that night, there was probably 1,500 people, something like that, in the building. And the, the Holy Spirit fell on us. The spirit of prayer fell on us. You had to try to not pray. You know how you try to, people, you have to kind of jump start them to get them to pray? That was the, was the opposite. It was on all of us. And in the middle of that time, after God had been teaching me about angels and how the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies, how he functions with them and so forth, uh, in the middle of that, Lynn Hammond stepped up. She grabbed the mic and she said, call out the city and the state you're from right now. And so I opened my mouth and I yelled, Madera, California. And when I did, it came from a place in me that I didn't even know existed. It was like it came out of the bottom of my feet. The Spirit of God. Because the Bible says angels hearken. They listen to and obey the voice. Everybody say voice. Of his word. When Jesus was in the wilderness for those 40 days and the devil came, what did he do? It is written. He gave voice to the word. It is said. It is written. And then after that, what happened? The angels show up. Angels are voice activated. They're voice activated. What are you saying? After he began to teach me about angels, I came across a book I didn't know I, ha I had at home. It's a, a man that in 83, he'd written this book. God began to teach him about angels. 
Matter of fact, he was a part of Ed Dufresne's ministry that he mentioned earlier tonight. And Ed wanted him to teach it in a seminar he was having, and so he was in the office praying before the meeting, this man. I don't even remember his name right now, but he was praying, and he said as he began to pray, he said the whole office filled up with angels. And he said one of them stepped forward and spoke to him and said, we're so glad that, you're fine, that somebody's finally teaching the people about us, that we've wanted to help them, but they wouldn't let us. And, you know, as I, as I read these things, as I heard these things, God began to talk to me. He said, you know, you've got faith for healing. How many of you, you activate your faith when you need healing? You use your faith to believe God for him to pay your bills. You use your faith to believe God for him to show you his word and to, you know, help you grow in, in who you are in Christ. Well, we need to believe God and use our faith for angels. He got that over to me. He said, you need to believe me for the angels to be used in your life. And after that, I started, I just made it a part of my whole vocabulary. Because when you honor the angels, you're honoring God. You're honoring them for what they're here to do. And I would pray as I was maybe somebody's sick mother in a, you know, somewhere else, I would say, Father, let the angels come and minister to her right now. And I started getting reports back from people that they would, would see angels. Or the very time we prayed, they would sense this presence in the room, come in the room and begin to minister to them. Now, what Brother Huggins said is true. We don't worship angels, but we don't ignore them either. And I think that somehow, and I'm not saying I understand all this, but somehow there's a key, somehow, for us to connect with the angels in a greater way. Amen? I mean, Jesus said, you're going to see him ascending and descending on me. Praise God. So, Father, we do thank you tonight. We thank you. You know, Bob here a couple of months ago, I was praying one morning and I saw the valley you live in. And the only way I know how to tell you this, it was like a, you know how you, you look at a, a stadium of people, I saw that whole valley full of angels, just full of angels. That's all I saw. I didn't hear him tell me anything. I just saw that. I had another uh, encounter with the Lord years ago about Madeira. This was back before God started teaching me all this about angels. I saw angels in this area, and it was almost like they were sitting in a circle around a campfire, kind of like an old Civil War thing or something where they're sitting around the campfire. And I asked the Lord, what is that? He said, that's the angels that are here. He said, they don't have much to do. Unfortunately, a lot of times we activate devils more than we do angels with our mouth. So maybe the Lord's just kind of giving us a little heads up here. Because I'm telling you the days we're going into, God's serious, the devil's serious, and we need to be serious. Not afraid, not intimidated, but at the same time understanding they hearken to the voice of his word. So, Lord, whatever it is you want us to understand about this, I pray in Jesus' name, we'll grasp it. Teach us out of your word, Lord. Activate, Lord, thank you that those angels are activated. I thank you for the angel of miracles and healings the angel of prosperity, Lord, that you've uh, told us is a part of this church. And we've seen them work, Lord. We've seen them work in our midst. We thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that the favor of God is upon your people right now and that God angels help bring them into not only what they need but where they need to go and what they need to, to understand and be a part of. We thank you for uh, Ambassador Huggins as he goes to the nation of Spain. God, I thank you that the doors are open for him. Mighty doors, mighty doors are open. Mighty, miraculous doors. That God, his voice will be used to stir the young people of that nation. And they'll come alive to their spiritual heritage. They'll no longer just be, uh, have this veil of religiosity over them and this fleshly uh, things of, of, that would cause them to be distracted. But God, they'll rise up in the true heritage, the Holy Ghost heritage. And so we thank you for opening the doors for Loretta and, and Brother Larry Huggins. We thank you for using them. And Lord, whatever part we're to play with that, if you want us to send them money, we will. Bring them before us to pray, we will pray for them. Whatever you want us to do concerning them, 
we thank you, Father, that they are sent ones. They're sent ones. They're sent ones to revive something that's been dead for hundreds of years. Something that's been lying dormant for hundreds of years. The enemy thought he had it dead and buried and it was over and gone. But God is sending his men and his women in to breathe the breath of the Holy Ghost, to prophesy to the dead bones, to raise up the army of God in that area of the world. And we thank you for them, Father. In Jesus' name, praise God. Well, let's just stand tonight. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Lord, I thank you for my friends, my family. We're all blood relatives in Christ. You've spoken to us tonight. As we leave, we're going to meditate on what you've said. We're going to ask you questions. We're going to open our heart for further revelation and insight. And God, I thank you that I'm going to hear testimonies of the work of angels. Yeah, taking them to a new level. People in here going to a new level, and your angels are going to help them get there. I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, bless them as they go to their homes. Give them a good night's sleep and rest, Lord. We thank you for tomorrow morning, for Brother Warren, Pastor Warren, and all that you're going to be doing this weekend. We give you honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, give somebody a hug or a handshake. Tell them you love them before you leave tonight. Have a safe journey home. Praise God.